This is the Generative Commons call on Wednesday, September 15th, 2021. And we're talking about Stacy's triple word score project idea to experiment on Trove. Okay. Um, yeah, cool. There you go. Now you're on the record. Okay. So, so I hate, you know I hate doing this. Um, <laughs> so it's to quote Trump, Yeah. we have the best people. Yeah, we do. We do. And the this best words. Project though. And the best okay. words. And the, <laughs> and the best words. Yeah. But yes, so yesterday I was really impressing Trove and I spent some time looking around it and that's where part of this comes from. The other part comes from recognizing that the way people invest is really changing. And app, like, you know, the younger generation, like they're using apps and things like that. And it made me think that's really going to change the way a lot of these um, business deals get put together. Mm -hmm. They're not going to be with a bunch of people in cigar bars or on golf courses. And I think that's a really good opportunity for us. So mm -hmm. the idea is, and this is where the triple word score comes in. If OGM created a consultancy, but it's a rating system. So there's some, like, I don't know if you buy like um, certified humane eggs. Um, I know what you mean. Yes, I, okay. I occasionally do and I occasionally don't. Okay, so the idea would be like to set up almost like an Angie's list, but mm -hmm. the rating system is based on systems thinking. So it's based on thrivability. And the education part of that would be teaching new entrepreneurs how to think through that lens. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, but the way we go about setting up the project is to look at the certified humane organization and overlay over that, because what that will do, it will connect us to that whole farming kind of community, which is going to overlap with a lot of what Klaus is working on, the same kind of people. And I look, they have a schedule for fees and things like that, that I think is pretty, you know, it looks like there's a lot of thought that went into that. Um, let's see, I'm getting nervous. Um, yeah, that's all right. Okay. So the way we start with people in our own group that are part that are willing to be part of this creative commons is as a show, each project gets you know highlighted. So they're getting a video of their project. We're getting to know the players. We're getting to know, you know what their ideas are. The second show, which is made up of the board members and those are experts in the different disciplines, they get to discuss how it could be made better they get to offer their feedback. If you're a member of the commons and you want that rating system and you want that process of being interviewed and having everything, you know, um, unpacked or whatever, whatever wording you want to use, that's for free because you're part of the community. If things really go the way I think they're going to go in the real world, as far as investing, it's going to be useful for businesses to have a rating. Because like, I want to know that what I'm investing in is, you know, helping the world, not just the business, but that it is, you know, gonna, uh, you know, sustainable in terms of the larger ecosystem. So I don't know what I left out, but basically there's two components. There's a profit making, the profit making part will be to people outside the commons that are at, will be targeting those businesses that are going on the apps that are trying to get individuals to invest on smaller scale. Like there are apps where you can invest for like a hundred bucks mm -hmm. and you know, you get a little bio, but how great would it be to those companies if they got a high rating? And it would be a way to train entrepreneurs to think in terms of the larger ecosystem because that's going to bring more investors to them. So, so are you familiar with GuideStar? No, I never heard of it. Um, you may want to Google them and just go, go look at them. They are a rating system for charities, I think. Um, and they've been around a long time. They're used by other companies. <clears throat> they may have new competitors and stuff like that. This is the one I remember. Uh, and I haven't looked into this area for a while. But, um, but there, there is an infrastructure already for rating donations, right? in that way. Um, and there are some attempts to do ratings of different kinds for companies, none of which is really stuck, but I, I, I think I see where you're going. And I like the idea of a thrivability rating of some sort. Um, just be, before I forget, 
Um, I've just kind of started making friends, uh, what's his last name, with a guy named Ruchi, um, uh, Kendall, uh, who founded Cheerful Giving, which got bought by Good World. Um, and they've become, their, their niche right now is a is basically corporate giving to try to figure out how to make that easier for corporations and uh, et cetera, et cetera. There's kind of a, there's a interesting stuff in the mix. Uh, and then also you're, I think, are you the person who's a fan of Michelle Holiday? Yes. Okay, so, so I'm in Michelle's group and stuff like that. And she's all about survivability, right? So she would be somebody invited to sit on a board. Right. Um, well, um, in fact, if you sort of thought about it, she's got a community of eager people who are in there. <clears throat> um, how might we equip, arm, motivate her uh, small army to participate in crowdsourcing or even or crowdfunding or both uh, the kinds of things that you want to see go through the system? Um, so I think I think you know engaging Michelle and asking her and then seeing what's up there and uh, having her participate in the design would be super super interesting. Well, so here's where the triple word score, because remember, it's not just about like the idea that I'm putting out, like that's just the framework to start us moving. Awesome. But if we approach it by taking a look at how Humane Certified put their stuff together, that already drives communities together with common interests. Even though, I mean, some of them might not, you know, there might be, you know, we might have a lot of vegans in the crowd that don't, don't want any animals. Right. But it's still going to, it's going to, it's going to, I think it's going to cause a lot of overlap. And then it's going to create more opportunities for people to participate in filming the shows. And what I'm always looking for is the social fabric part of it. I think that if we approached it this way, it brings in business people that are usually not in this, you know, there's a really, there's a, there's a great dichotomy between people that find their way into the business sector as opposed to different sectors. Mm -hmm. It's not that their hearts aren't good, but they really value money and there's nothing wrong with that. And I'm not making judgments on that. You know, I was looking at um, an interview with Candace Owens and Russell Brand. Mm -hmm. It really struck me. She really thinks that her way of thinking is for the benefit of the world. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of people that really do believe that focusing on their individual um, accomplishments is the best way. So we need to reach that mindset, not the ones that already think like us. So again, the whole idea of a rating system for businesses, they kind of have to be part of it, whether they, like if we succeed, they have to be part of it, whether they want it or not. Mm -hmm. But all the while, we're creating connections between people of all different kinds just because of that, those topics, by mm -hmm. focusing on the farming, the agricultural part of it. Because we have to stop sounding like a charity. Because when you hear, like, you know, charity, you feel like you're being asked for something. Right, right. Yeah, that's interesting. Hmm. You feel like you're being asked for something unless you're among the people the charity is serving, in which case you feel like, maybe it's paternalistic, like somebody is here to help and you lose some autonomy or some dignity or something else, depending on the charity. Um, can you unpack the triple word score for a second? Like which, which layers of value you see? Okay. So you want to do weaving the world. We would be weaving the world because we would be highlighting the different. So we'd start off highlighting the people involved with this certified humane. We'd sit, we, I'm sure we would find connections between all the, you know, all the contacts that we each know. If we each go out, like, you know, you've mentioned this before, we're like one degree away from somebody. Um, so, oh, the triple word score. You yes. me. Okay. So the triple word score is one, we're developing a consultancy rating system organization that has the two arms, the educational arm, and then the rating arm, which could be profit, you know, for profit. And we could choose to test out a new system by saying that 90% of the profits go to the commons. 
to feed the commons with the jobs and that's where we get the workers from. Right. Um, the second part is that I think it's going to overlap with a lot of Klaus, with a lot of what Klaus and his groups are doing. Yep. Because he's now connected to a lot of people. The third thing is it's weaving the world. You already mentioned Michelle and her group. There are lots of other groups. It'll give all those groups a place to plug in. Right. So we're weaving the world. We're helping with the farm to table. And we're also helping to teach a new kind of mindset because we already said it's very hard to think outside of the paradigm that you're already in. But now if we're changing the rules of success, it changes the way we think. Yeah. Um, and it's very interesting because um, I, was, I was in a conversation, was this yesterday's um, Build OGM call? I don't remember. But, but basically the idea that um, there's a whole bunch of people out there with very different mindsets about how to fix the world. No, this was happening with Hank and Leif on Monday. Um, you know, there's a bunch of people that are like, entrepreneurship is the answer. All we have to do is turn everybody into entrepreneurs and that will solve all the world's problems. And I'm incredibly skeptical about that. Um, uh, libertarianism isn't that far removed from there. Like those, there's a big overlap between the entrepreneurship crowd and the libertarian crowd, but you know, they, they've got sort of the answers uh, to the world. But then um, I'm forgetting what the other what the other um, solutions were. But but like the the fifth one was uh, well we've already destroyed the earth we have to get off the earth so all of the wealthy male billionaires who are trying to like do space travel so we can populate Mars right and my 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 tongue in cheek answer to that is you know I've seen enough good sci-fi to know that if you don't solve for trust first you don't want to be on the first thousand spaceships off this planet um, but. But the entrepreneurship, so, and, and the libertarian perspective is terrible for commons, like terrible for commons. Libertarianism, I have not found the flavor of libertarianism that's good at public goods and that is healthy for it because basically they think that no resources should be spent on anything other than protecting private ownership, roughly. Um, and, and, so, and so entering a conversation with other people who are, who are aiming for similar kinds of things we might actually be able to explore those boundaries and figure out how these things work together and ask to solve the problems or something else. I don't know, but, but I, I like that part of it a lot. Well, and the thing is, it allows for all those mindsets, which I think is what you're saying. But, you know, because because the entrepreneurs want their their project to be rated. Right. And then the people doing the rating are part of, they're not entrepreneurs, they're part of the commons that are doing it. Um, but a separate conversation, I've been thinking a lot about the whole libertarian thing. That's yeah. a different conversation. But I do think, I mean, that, I wish we had a show where we could talk strategy about, you know, political things. And I wish I knew who were the people that were shaping those conversations, because that's where I want to be. So, that's what I think I'm good at. <laughs> so there's no reason Weaving the World can't go into that territory and would happily do so, like very happily do so. It mostly depends on who we choose to go talk to next, right? So if we talk to somebody who is deep into that piece of what's going on, then that's what we take apart and that's what we start talking about and that's where we go. And then uh, we, could, we could go from there to other people who care about those things. We could go from there to experiments, um, you know, that, that those conversations suggest and see what we can set up. Uh, it'd be really cool. There's a lot of nice stuff there. Um, Keeping the Scrabble analogy. Yeah. that you started yeah i think that this approach leaves so many places for people to plug in yeah to, to put their to put their words down and that's you know that was behind the idea of the game right. but with trove i don't need the game anymore we could just get started and do something because there's a place to post the project now yes. if, if you're going to propose a consultancy which is a, a profit making entity that is selling services and some insights then somebody needs to run it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, are you hoping to float the idea to see if someone shows up who wants to run it? Do you want to run it? Like what, how, what shape does that consultancy take? Okay. The only thing I want to do is come with the idea and serve on the board. Right. That, that's all. I, I don't know anything about it. Do I know? Do, I'll tell you what I do know. I yep. do know the people that I would go to that would be like my fantasy dream team. And they're all OGM people. And okay. I think that, I think that there would be something within this project for each one of the people in my mind. You know, like everybody could find something that motivates them internally, which is always my goal. Right. 
Um, good. And and um, and it's it's relatively easy to float this idea. I mean, it's going to mean you have to uh, figure out how to use trove to manifest these ideas, um, and then and then I'm floating, I'm floating it to you, Jerry. Well, I, I want to know if you think it's worth it. Put your own spin. Let's do this as a group. That's what that's what I'm saying. Like I would love a call where we sit and do this together. <laughs> um, okay. That sounds that sounds good, and um, and we need to flesh out the idea from different directions. We, it, you know, Pete will say it needs a, it needs a project plan, which I will agree with. Uh, and the project plan includes like who's on the team, you know, who are you serving, um, how, when do you meet? Is this is this a, is this a thing that has regular you know regular calls or conversations or whatever as well? And that's what I'm suggesting we record mm -hmm. because you know even for me to go on Trove. I'm learning it. It would be nice to have a partner to do it together, to film it so other people could say, I mean, that's the whole. So, so one thing you could easily do is um, you could ask another OGMer who's not on Trove yet, who hasn't created a profile. You've already created your profile, right? Yes. <laughs> okay. But I'm so thinking if I do this, I might take my picture off and just make it so that it's clear. It's, it's like global mind. Uh, and I, I, I use global mind. Let me just, you like this because I know you're. I like global mind because you can take it two ways. You know how you mind the children, uh -huh. so it's not yeah. just global mind, but it's global taking care. Yeah, good. That's uh, that's one of the double entendres I like about open global mind. It's mind minding the globe. Um, yeah, and minding stewardship. All those things are are great words. And um, I've heard it a few times that two words are better. I keep hearing it when Jack was telling his story. Right. He mentioned that they made him take out the third word. I know Trump always used two words. Hmm. I know that um, Bentley mentioned something in, in terms of creating logos, that two would be better. So that's been in my head. So that's why global mind. <laughs> hmm. Cool, cool. Um, so where was I heading? Sorry. <laughs> that's okay. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to think, um, we can easily set up a call and invite people in to, to sort of talk, talk about this thing and, and shape it. Um, there's a couple pieces of this that are like really large projects, like, like a rating system to be credible, viable, anything like that is a really big project all by, all by its lonesome. Uh, <clears throat> and for example, um, Edelman has a trust barometer, Edelman PR. Right. The, the, oh, so there's a public relations agency and I happen to know the daughter of the founder and uh, stuff like that because uh, I used to be in New York. Uh, anyway, Edelman every year, every January publishes the Edelman Trust Barometer for the year. And they do a big survey of, you know, is business trusted, is government trusted? And they sort of subdivide and do a bunch of analysis. Um, the whole thing is a little bit ironic and strange because Edelman and other PR agencies have been guilty of spin and re representing bad clients and all of that, which are all acts of mistrust. So, so I think it's a very interesting sort of brand positioning thing that they're doing a trust barometer, set that aside. Um, but it's a, it's a ton of work to produce this thing, but, they, but they, they reveal it at Davos every year at the World Economic Forum, which hasn't happened now for two years. Um, and that has helped make it a really big thing. So they get a, they get a lot of attention, uh, uh, you know, and when you get attention, corporate executives start to talk about it. Gosh, we fell on the trust barometer. That's important, you know, which are the trusted brands? And this is different from which are the best known brands, which is somebody else's survey from some other corner of, of the business world, right? And so, so there's a few things like that. And I think that the world of evaluating sustainability, thrivability, uh, reliability as a charitable subject as GuideStar does, there's a, already a bunch of, of, of work in these worlds and I don't know what that map looks like. I don't know who's already doing what, right? Um, yeah, go ahead. So keep in mind that part of this is about the journey. So mm -hmm. it's about creating interesting calls that people would want to even come to talk about. So mm -hmm. we could not so much focus on the end product, but just the little steps to get there, I think create interesting calls that people seem to be seem to want to be a part of. Right, right. I want to keep that focus too, that we can go slow. Exactly. Because we, that's the fun part where we get to really, 
you know, I think about Facebook. Didn't that start off like those were like friends, like trying to do something? Facebook was Zuckerberg and a couple other buddies trying to find hot chicks on the on the Harvard campus. It was basically we're going to rate the hot babes on on Harvard campus. That's what it started as. It was kind of crappy. But that's my point. That's and my the, point. How something could become so. It was really just for their own gratification. Right. And if we could approach it that way, right, it might not be a bad idea. But the second level of Facebook, I think, and I only have an amateur outsider's view of this, the second level was it turned into this ironic Harvard Insiders social network where nobody was using their real name, everybody was using funny fake names, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then it was just a Harvard thing and nobody outside of harvard.edu was allowed onto Facebook, which made it exclusive, which made everybody else want to be on it. Then it was Ivy League universities only. Then it was universities only. Then it was opened up to the public and your mom showed up and it was like, ah, oh, this stopped being cool. <laughs> um, um, but, the, but they sort of, they worked that progression very intentionally and really well uh, because it, it created FOMO, you know, from other people who then just wanted to pile in and they made it's it easy. Uh, fear FOMO? of missing out. Yes, that's a good one. That's yeah. A good one. So they, they basically generated a bunch of FOMO um, and they killed off Friendster. They just nuked Friendster. They also made it really easy to move your Friendster account over to Facebook. They did, they, I don't remember what it was, but they said, do this and this and we'll suck all your friends out of Friendster and drop them into Facebook. Ta-da! Um, and they were quite cutthroat about everything. Um, so yeah. We wouldn't be cutthroat. We no, be we're we're not we're not cutthroat kind of kind of folks here. No. Um, good. So so a it's easy to set up a weaving the world call about this and to 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 move the ideas around and shape them. B you need to figure out how to describe this to put it into Trove, for example, and also maybe to to build if you want to keep going with this if it if it starts catching on to build the baby website, figure out you know who else wants to be on on the team, and then it, then it's kind of sort of up to you to decide you could spawn a parallel show to weaving the world. Um, and it's funny, I typed weaving the word in the, in the chat by mistake. Um, you could create your own uh, open mind show and be the host of it and invite in whoever you want and do those explorations and figure out like which way you want to go and figure out what are the moving parts and all that. That's relatively simple to do. And that's not a company, that's not the consultancy. That's just a, a, an online show where you host conversations, invite people, record them, put, you know, post them, and do a little bit more than we're doing here on the OGM calls, right? The, the OGM calls, we're doing 80% of what constitutes the show, but we don't have it listed on iTunes podcasts. We don't produce a podcast, even though <clears throat> for every call, I get the video file and the audio file um, and the, the text file. And for the Thursday calls, I get a transcript of the conversation. Um, we're only really using the video files uh, here. But the, but the audio file shows up for free, but then you have to edit that. And if it's going to smell like a podcast, it needs the, a recorded intro and outro, uh, and it needs a little bit of back-end work, which is not that hard to do. I mean- and there, but, but here's the thing. If yeah. we will work, again, I don't want this to be mine. I, I really mm. love just you know being part of a panel and just giving bits of, in, that's what I like to do. I'm not looking for anything more than that. <laughs> Go ahead. I know. And if you want open mind as the thing you envision it to have any life past a call, then you probably have to inhabit it for a while and be the motive energy for it. Like the way I'm the motive energy for open global mind and looking to be the motive energy for weaving the world, because I think that's the vehicle that I want to point people toward. Um, it, without a human who's there who says, I'm going to be the host, I'm going to drive this thing, it, it, it floats in, 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 unless you're really lucky and somebody comes by and says, oh, can I just adopt the shell you've described and be the person who runs it, which doesn't happen very often. That, like, so, that, that, that's rare. So let me be really frank. Yeah, <laughs> I yeah. have no problem doing that and I would love to do that for a while. However, unless I have at least two people that have some street cred, there is not going to be any FOMO generated. Um, so, so what you just said is perfect because what it means is one of the first things to do is to find out who those couple very, very close in allies are who have, 
who, who who have extreme affinity with the vision you're talking about and want to help you do it and, and have different skills from yours. I can think of, you know, because I, I, you know, I've been thinking about this for a long yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. So th there are there are people in this, you know, in the Facebook world that have been very mentor like to me that I think mm -hmm. if there was something, they would definitely step in and supply their bit of expertise without taking, you know, they have their own things that they're working yep. on, but they would definitely pitch in. I feel like the one thing that I could say is that the people around me have very high levels of integrity and mm -hmm. that's going to help with building trust because mm -hmm. that's where, you know, I don't, did you see the chart that Ken put up about trust? Uh, somebody wrote that it was from yeah. Stephen Covey's book. <clears throat> it is. So the, <clears throat> so the thing is, this kind of a situation is one that, that would allow for the people that don't have trust on the left-hand side, the integrity, but they're really good at something, right. but it doesn't allow them to be in positions of decision-making where they can destroy the trust from the left-hand side. Does that make sense? I think so. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I've given a couple speeches where I, uh, there, there are a bunch of different trust models. And, and, and one of the interesting ways of breaking them apart is the difference between cognitive trust and affective trust. And I think it's called cognitive. Uh, the cognitive trust is, uh, is this person capable of doing the thing they're going to say? And will they likely carry it out? Like, are they, are they reliable to do the thing they said they're going to do? And then affective trust is, do I like them? <clears throat> and do I think they have my best interests at heart? So act, affective cognitive. It's really easy to look at Donald Trump and say, this guy's a, a moron and an asshole, but I think he's actually going to carry out the things he's threatening to do. And I want that done and the, go vote for him. And that's a very reasonable approach uh, to voting for Trump. Yeah, but, but, but that's where I'm different. I, I choose to find the people that are that I know can do the job and they have the trust. I know. They have to and, have both. And most of us, most of us would like the whole package. And I think a lot of people faced by Hillary versus Trump were like, well, this is the lesser of two evils. And, and my goal is to destroy the system. And the dude who's going to destroy the system is probably Donald J. And so they vote, they vote for him with the hope that with the system in ruins, some other new system will arrive that's better for them because, because staying inside the same system is not working for them at all for whatever reason, for, for religious reasons, for financial reasons, for whatever. You're in the middle of the country. The industries that sustained your region have just disappeared. Farming is under siege. Water, the water table is disappearing. Everything is like for crap. You know, and no, kid, no kids are coming back from college back to town. So the town is dying. You're going to vote to break the system, right? right? You want something else to happen. But on a more local level, like just yeah. among people, too many of us are willing to make those same sacrifices. Mm -hmm. We deal with people that we know are not really worthy of trust, but you know, it's business. I hear people say that I talk to people all the time, especially people in the entertainment industry, because mm -hmm. I have a lot of friends that are either actors or comedians. And I was thinking my very first, uh, when I was in college, I took a theater class and I remember the first day, and this is many years ago. So it really stuck with me. And he said, if you're offered a commercial, no matter what the product's for, even if you don't believe in it, you take it. Because mm -hmm. if you don't take it, someone else will. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, just throw your integrity away. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. what you're being taught. So again, going back to the, you know, the initial project is really to kind of teach having a different mindset. Mm -hmm. So it's not so much about what might be created or might not be created. It's just the process of getting there and it's being used to create a social environment because you're going to come to calls that you might think are enjoyable. Mm -hmm. So even if we were to have a call on this, I want people to come that feel like giving their opinion. Mm -hmm. They don't have to commit to do anything further. They're mm -hmm. just coming to have a conversation and that conversation, that call. Yes, that I would take. I would be willing to facilitate and do. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. That sounds great. Are you interested? Um, good. So, I mean, why don't we set up? Uh, why don't we set up a, a call to do this? And the question is, do we set up a call separately called Open Mind, or do we weave this into the first calls of weaving the world? Um, 
and I think I think my first couple of calls probably need to be with people who are recognized. Uh, you know, if weaving the world is going to be visiting uh, experts and weaving what they've written in books into the world, kind of, which is the, the the starting conceit, we probably start there. But the idea for weaving the world is then to talk to lots of different people who have different good ideas about how to do this. So so we could weave you into that process, but that call probably doesn't happen for a few weeks. Yeah, I think I I think I, I would like a call, which is more like you know, like you said once, group of people getting together. Let's put on a show. Yeah, I yeah. Think, With Mickey um, Rooney and and Judy Garland. Yeah, like you know, I would want Vincent to be there because we could use Trove in it. So that's mm -hmm. helping him. You know, it's it's about taking all the people that that might find some interest in the project and bringing them together. Mm -hmm. So the so, so the simplest thing to do is to just declare a pop-up call, a one-time pop-up call um, that you're sort of the special guest on with this idea. And then we make sure that a few people that you think ought to be there and you invite in whoever um, you think ought to be there. We try to find a time that works for most of us. Um, and then just, just hold that call. See who shows up, see what happens, post that call on YouTube, and then, and then see where we are. Okay. The only thing I would add, I really would rather feel like a facilitator more than the owner of this idea. I'm not comfortable with that. I would really like this to be more like we are going to do a project. Which project do we want to start together? Mm -hmm. And if if this is one of the projects that people say, yeah, let's do that, that works, then we do it. So I think I'm I think I'm trying to say that if this is going to smell like a project and look like a project and walk like a project, it needs a project champion. Okay, but I want something in a smaller bite-sized piece that, so like, for example, right. maybe maybe I'll say, okay, I want to be in charge, I'll, I'll take lead of the show that's going to be about how Humane Certified got started. Right. And I'll say, does anybody want to help on that hmm. show? And then we could go through what's going to be needed. Right. You know, we're going to need video people, editing people. Does anybody know anybody that's involved with that organization? And it could be planning the first show. That's right. as far as I just want to do one little step at a time. Okay. Um, and and part of part of your mission is to find other like-minded people who want to be the different moving parts of what you're describing. Right. Right. That's it. Yes. Um, and that's who you want to invite into the first call. Yes, that I can um, do. Yeah, I mean, and so you've been on a bunch of Klaus and food system calls, um, and and we've been trying, like like we've been trying really hard to figure out how to bring people around Klaus who know how to execute and all that kind of stuff. And Anne showed up, and Penicus, who's phenomenal um, mm -hmm. and really loves operations and has a little period right now between different you know jobs where she's like, hey, I could I could sort of invest some of my energy into this thing. Um, and Klaus, I think, comes out of a corporate environment where he's used to having uh, people who report to him who know how to execute all these different kinds of things. But there was a gap there, like we, we and we were having trouble filling that gap. And also, we were having trouble, I think, narrowing down what it is exactly that the the CFS project actually brings to the world. What's what's its focus? Um, and that's and that's with like a senior person who's got, who's willing to be the the head of it. And trying to figure out all the moving parts, and that and that one's still bumpy right now. It's like it's it's okay, it's moving along, but it's not a thing with its own energy at, at this point yet. So so you've been witness to that process of trying to stand up the CFS project as a, as an ongoing thing with with you know with some lift from its wings. Um, yeah, that's go ahead. Exactly, that's exactly why I'm not coming from this as like um, a mission oriented thing. Yeah, I want to create something that's enjoyable to show up to. So like I come here because I enjoy coming. I want to create a space where people come. Yes. So. so so what you're describing fits beautifully into the, the vision I imagine for weaving the world and feeding the big fungus, right? Because my goal is to have multiple shows, whatever that means, multiple conversation sequences that are running in parallel interweaving with each other and nurturing this, this generative commons. That's the, the framing for the call we're in right now. Um, so, so if you wanted to stand up one of those and be one of the parallel shows, that is just awesome. And I would put you on the website and say, over here, and, and like over here is Stacy who hosts Open Mind, uh, Global Mind, 
And this is well, this is their theme and this is how they're going and they're hosting a great bunch of conversations. But in order for me to be able to say that or do that, there needs to be a there there. And you're saying, I wanna be an advisor. I don't really wanna be the host or the center of the there there, which means <clears throat> either you find a couple of people who would love to be co-hosts or just kind of own it, build it, do it, which is awesome. And I wanna help you do that. Or I don't know what the what, what plan B is. Let me ask you a different question. Okay. With your with your weaving the world, where's what's the first? Who's the first people you want to interview? Um, I don't know. I've got. I haven't. I haven't made the list, and I've got a bunch of interesting ideas in my head about where to go. I'd rather not have white men at the front of the list. I'd rather uh, go to people who are pretty different and uh, serve people who have different ideas. So Afrofuturism, ecofeminism. Like I'm looking in those areas. Um, I, I would then have to go say hi and introduce myself to some of those people. Uh, I have some entree, but not a whole bunch, but, but I kind of want to like not do the, we're going to talk to Daniel Schmachtenberger and no, uh, no uh, Harari and whatever, like, I don't want to do the usual suspects on this, even though a lot of them have really interesting ideas. Like the problem with Schmachtenberger is that I don't find any of his work that's less than an hour and a half long to listen to. It's like, I kind of, a part of what OGM hopes to do is to digest and make more accessible a lot of these people's thinking, right? So that you could go into my brain or some other artifact, I don't care what it is, uh, and go, oh, here's five ideas. I really love this fifth idea, only the fifth idea. Let's go deep on that. And how do I implement that in, in my project? That, uh, that's part of what I OGM wants to try to do is, is right. make, these, you make these things really accessible and useful. So I guess what I'm saying to you is when you're thinking about where you want to start, yeah. is there a place if we were drawing a Venn diagram where that starting point could be within the food, in you know, within the food sort of soil environment neighborhood? Um, sure. And I think that I think that a food nexus, soil nexus call would be a fabulous thing to have in the first half dozen calls. Fabulous. Because then I would so the way I, the way I would see it. So let's say you're the the face of weaving the world, and I'm the face of this other thing. And then there's a third. There's got to be a third, uh, private a third, and that that could actually be a revolving thing, depending on who's interested at the time. How do we how do we create a plan that takes us both one step at a time along the same path? Perfect. That's what I'm looking to do. Cool. And by the way, um, over time, we don't have to stand up all of these parallel shows. There are a million podcasts out there already, some, yes. of which, some of which are very groovy and are just like trying to get attention by themselves. And they're like, I'm over here. Hello, people come, come listen to my podcast in enough volume that I can make a living doing this thing. Right. Um, and so what we could do is say, hey, if you're willing to work sort of within this framework of feeding the big fungus, whatever that turns out to mean over time and, and so forth, then we can all point to each other and we become a little flotilla of shows that are moving together next to each other. And then I think what I think OGM's kind of responsibility in this, and it, we're not certainly not the only people doing this, but I think we're the, we're the ones that, who really give a damn about this is what is the shared artifact that lies inside the big fungus. What is, what is the actual manifestation of that fungus? Uh, you know, the Wikipedia is a piece of the big fungus. It's all, it, and it already exists. And thank you, Jimmy Wales, and you know, tens of thousands of volunteers, but there's this beautiful artifact that is only an encyclopedia. And it's not the whole picture of this shared, shared memory and everything else. And by the way, every episode of every show we make is not allowed to become a page in Wikipedia because the Wikipedia has a thing called the notability criterion, right? Do you know about notability? Yeah. Wiki, so the dynamics of Wikipedia are super fascinating. Um, one of them is that you know people just started coming in and putting their 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 daughter's garage band into the Wikipedia, and it was just a garage band that dissolved after four shows and and so forth. And so they said, look, this is an encyclopedia. And to be in an encyclopedia, something has to be notable, noteworthy, which ironically means it should have been referenced in traditional media. So your band, unless it has a write-up in Rolling Stone and Variety and has, has issued three albums that are available in stores, which all sounds like old media, 
unless it has those things, it's not worth building a Wikipedia page for. You're welcome to go build your band's website web page on Wix or Squarespace and go crazy, but a Wikipedia entry to be on Wikipedia needs to be worth remembering, right? And so, and so that's another service we can provide. If it, it, if we could all, almost like unionize those real small players and they become part of Global Mind and Global Mind gets the Wikipedia page. Um, quite possibly. Well, Global Mind to get a Wikipedia page would have to become like a big ongoing entity of some sort. That's what like I see startups that don't have Wikipedia pages because they're somehow not famous enough, not big enough. So it's, it's, it's not an easy thing to go um, start a Wikipedia page, but, but there could be an aggregation of things here, yes. I, see, I have a really different perspective because like, I look at Facebook, I always saw the power of Facebook. Uh -huh. The fact that I'm here sitting here talking to you yeah. should be proof that I, I was able to utilize Facebook in a special way. Yep, yep. <laughs> I mean, you know, you mentioned uh, you were gonna have a talk with Jim Rutt. I was looking yesterday, I was having instant, I was having messages with him in 2017, mm -hmm. you know, cool. I mean, it's been a really, so my point is I always had in the back of my mind, if we could change the culture of that fake world, we could change the world. And we know right. it works because we saw what happened with the COVID misinformation, how just 12 people were able to change everything. So when people kept saying, let's leave Facebook, I kept saying, no, stay here because it's small enough that you can get a total picture of. It's mm -hmm. small enough that you can really find those leverage points and change um, the culture. You know, if you look at every group as like their own country, right? you can start by changing things that way. Sometimes smaller is better when it comes to being able to shift things. I don't know, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, but to all those people that are really like that are on Patreon or really trying to, you know, they're doing things as a labor of love. Those are the people I want to reach out to. I don't want to reach out to the really notable people that are already. I mean, we would they would come like as an expert, as a guest. But I want to reach out to the people that are doing things because they're so driven. They really they are doing it with no compensation. Mm -hmm. Those are the people I want to reach. Mm -hmm. um, me too. And I also want to figure out um, how do we start to compensate the people who are feeding the fungus, right? I want, well, I want, to, I want to figure out, like, it's, it's one thing, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm obsessive about feeding my brain. I'm going to do that and publish my brain openly anyway. It's going to happen. No big deal. I'd love to make a living doing that. But you know, if Gene Bellinger is making a living build, writing Kumu diagrams for other people, and he'd like to participate, it'd be nice if the commons could generate some kind of funding so that he, in fact, is like merrily helping us improve this thing and able to kind of keep doing that for some substantial piece of his time. And, you know, six other people with other tools from other backgrounds doing the same sort of thing. I'd love to prototype that and figure that out. And the reason we were having conversations about guilds and all that, and like, I own mapwhisperers.com, is that I had a, this fantasy in my head that we would actually collect up a bunch of people like Gene and Christina Bowen and me and a bunch of others who love the mapping, specifically the mapping aspect. We would form up as a guild, uh, which would be like a hiring hall. We would then we would then stand up a website and a consulting service that would sell Map Whisperer hours to anybody who want, who needed us. The way that you can go get a graphic facilitator today, but nobody's heard of a Map Whisperer. Let's invent that category. Right, that was part of what the the whole idea of guilds was, um, and and story threaders is a different guild with a different set of skills and a different set of members, which I'd also like to be a part of, but that you know those things don't exist yet. But couldn't that department be part of a consultancy that's being built that that's also part of an educational platform and program and all that? Um, entirely could. Um, it's all pretty complicated. We need somebody who, who knows how to run a consultancy, for example, right? Like making a consultancy actually work is not the simplest thing in the world. And then and making one actually thrive and making the numbers work properly so that so that everybody's doing well, that's hard. I've seen, I, I, you know, and I've been a part of multiple consultancies in, in different ways. Now, at the same moment, 
one of the things that's happening is this DAO kind of, you know, the, the, these exotic electronic cryptocurrency structures where people are coming together and doing projecty kind of stuff. That's really, really interesting because it could be, it could be that the infrastructure for consultancy is light and external and like a thin membrane or something. Um, I don't know. And, and I'm, I'm busy researching and trying to figure out what would that look like? Because there's a difference between, you know, I'm part of the founding story of Scient. I don't know if you remember Scient, but it was one of the consultancies in the dot-com era. Because um, I know the founder of Scient from before he founded Scient and he wanted to hire me for the founding of Scient. And I was like, can I just do a little consulting for you? Which I did. Um, but there's a really big difference between standing up one of those suckers and having a bunch of employees doing consulting engagements and having a sales force closing gigs or whatever and doing something extremely lightweight and organic and decentralized, which is, I think, the way you and I would probably like this thing yes. to go. So okay. when, when I talk about consultancy, I'm talking about first for the people in our group, you're already doing it. You're, yeah. you're already there helping people like Vincent. Right. You're already doing it. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. So I'm talking about building on doing. Ugh, yeah. Uh, so I'm agreed because a piece of the a piece of the mission of weaving the world is to weave those parts as well. It's not just. So I think the the obvious surface level mission of weaving the world is to go to big thinkers and weave their ideas into a larger context. So, you know, donut economics, awesome. How does donut economics fit in with sustainability? How does donut economics fit in with feminism? <clears throat> How does it fit in with uh, libertarianism? Uh, what are the edges? How do these things, you know, where are their overlaps? That's, that's fun and that's interesting. But that's not the stuff that we're talking about right now, which is really useful and interesting as well. Right. So how, how might an independent person make a living in donut economics? What is the platform for, for individuals who believe in donut economics and want to bring it to the world? How do they make a living doing that? That's really interesting, right? And, and, and what is the flow of value for individuals and organizations in the donut economics greater sphere? And I know a few donut consultants who are sort of, you know, they, they want to be doing that. Um, Theory U is maybe a better example because it's, it's older, it's more fleshed out, it's, it's got a lot of momentum. Um, and I think there's a bunch of consultants who, who are out there doing theory, you kind of, and I don't know if they have a certification process. I mean, I know that Pine and Gilmore have a whole like experience economy certification process. I get their emails and they've like, they'll have classes where you pay $2,000 and you become a, a certified experience economy uh, consultant. And then, you know, good luck to you. So I know it sounds naive, but I'm going to say it again. I think it's so important, at least in this beginning thing, to take the money out of it. Mm -hmm. what, like, and that's why I brought up Facebook in its early stages. They weren't thinking about money. It's right. possible to create something. And I think actually it's more fulfilling, thrivable, all those things, if you're not thinking about it first in terms of money. So I totally agree. And I think the last 18 months of OGM are exactly that. <laughs> I mean, really. I mean, yeah. we, we haven't really made a dime, um, and and uh, but but some of us would like to be able to do this a lot more and make a living from it, including including me. Uh, and so Jordan said something to me a couple of days ago that was really nice. It was like, Jerry, how do we how do we build a vehicle so that you can serve your best and highest purpose, which appears to be convening, facilitating, doing the jujitsu brain thing, uh, and then sort of nurturing, coaching, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm like, if I could sit at the helm of a little vessel, a tiny vessel, I don't, I don't have any desire to, to, to run a hundred person company and be responsible for their, their incomes and livelihoods. I just want to create, uh, I want to be part of a thriving ecosystem uh, where everybody has a, a vehicle and a vessel and we can kind of dock and undock depending on what projects we're working on, right? What does that look like? Cool. So I, I'm trying, I've been trying now for 18 months to figure out what does that look like? What, what shape does that vessel take? And so, so OGM is a fiscal sponsee of Jordan's company called Lionsburg, um, which means I can go attract grant funding, but I'm having trouble describing what I'm asking funders to fund. Like, what is, what is this thing? And, you know, Pete asks a question, so Jerry, is OGM an organization or a hashtag and a movement? And I'm like, at the end of that call, it's like, it's probably better off as a hashtag 
it's like, okay, so great. So I'm not pitching OGM to people. So I think I'm pitching weaving the world. And how do I make that compelling and interesting? Right? Is there, is there value in terms of funding in, to create something that encourages entrepreneurs to think in more of a systems thinking way? That's a really interesting piece of all this. I mean, I would love, I would love to have a, like toxoplasmosis is the, the virus that causes mice to lose their fear of cats, I think, or something like That's that. For pregnant women, why they have to stay away from cats. Bingo. But, but, but what it does in the ecosystem is it causes mice to lose their fear of cats. So they come out of hiding and the cats eat them. And the toxoplasmosis virus loves that because it lives through the, the cat digestive system, which is why pregnant women shouldn't touch them. Anyway, I would love to find a, a mind worm that would take a bunch of people who think like pure libertarianism is the only answer and soften them into systems thinking and into finding some other, some, some bridge into nurturing the commons and figuring out how that all works together. That'd be great. But see, to me, that fits within these projects. Like, for example, I know the topic that I would approach libertarians with. I already have that in my head. And that's why I said that's another great show. Yeah. Because I think that I think there. well, I'm changing the topic. I think there is a tie in between the drug company, you know, between exploring the role of drug companies the Ill illegal, the criminalization of like using mushrooms. Mm -hmm, There's mm -hmm. a whole, you know, I mean, mushrooms weren't illegal until I think the seventies. Uh, Nixon, schedule five, uh, schedule five narcotics, basically. Uh, he illegalized a whole bunch of stuff that was not illegal before that moment. So to me, and I actually have this on another page here somewhere. There were like a few topics that I saw would overlay where it was uh, mental health, different laws, health care, drugs, poverty. And I really felt that there would be a way to frame it so that the libertarians, which I consider the far, far right, you know, if you go around in a circle, and the far, far left could actually come to a place of agreement. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it's really funny. I, whenever, you know, friends are talking to me about like doing mushrooms or something, I always tell them I never did any of those. It always, it always scared me to do anything that would alter my mind. And I said, and again, I was very young. I said, I remember hearing about Art Linkletter's daughter. Oh. Well, I start doing a little digging and I come to find out that she was, this was suicide. This had nothing to do with drugs. She fell from a sick, look, look, do you see my brain? Oh yeah. <laughs> And it's connected to an article in the New York Times called LSD's Long Strange Trip, which I think I think the story was that she was taking LSD, but it turns out she just fell from a six-story window. Well, it was probably suicide. And at the time, that was more shameful for them. They wanted to cover up the suicide, so they were willing to blame it on drugs. Bingo. But here's so, the interesting part. Yeah. I looked up the, I was, I was seven years old. So somehow, whatever was going on in my environment, which I look at kids today and what they're getting in their environment, what their beliefs are, yep. this false information shaped the next 50 years of my life. Yeah, yeah, I get that. Um, so here's where a lot of this, this stuff lives in my brain. And, and um, highlighted here, Portugal decriminalized all drugs for personal use in 2001, and it's been a success. Right. Yeah, I mean, I guess I, I, I don't know. I don't want to pretend I do know, but yeah. I would think it would be a success. I can tell you from like a, a message forming point of view that the way the conversations are framed in our country are really, really bad. Yeah. And I don't want to say that it's done on purpose because I, I, I don't think I, it is. I, I don't know. I, I actually think it is. It's uh, I, I think part of it is ignorance and part of it is very intentional. Okay, so for either, whether you're somebody that believes it's intentional, and I definitely am open to that possibility. I keep yeah. saying, you know, especially when we talk about the media, yeah. but the messaging is so bad. And I know that if we change the messaging, it could work because this is what I was doing in 2016. When I would spend time talking to regular people, I would purposely go to people that had different um, political views and I would throw out ideas. Well, would you be for this? Would you be? And I would get agreement. Mm -hmm. 
right. now at that time I was in a different mind space and I really thought, you know, I can do this. I came across too many bad actors. I don't want to ever do something like that again, but I know it can be done. Mm -hmm. because, you know, um, I've done it and mm -hmm. I've got, you know, I purposely throw ideas to people that I know are against something. And I say, well, how about this? How about mm -hmm. that? Cool. Which is, um, so a different way of looking at this, you know how uh, the late show that used to be Jon Stewart uh, that is now Trevor Noah, uh, you know how they have correspondence? Yes, yes, right? yes. Some, some, of who end, some of who end up having their own shows or whatever, uh, some of whom are just great stand-up comedians on their own, but, uh, but there's uh, Jonathan Klepper is one of the ones now, and he'll go interview people at a MAGA rally. Yeah, and like, and so he's, he's just so good on his feet. He's like, so, and he has this like innocent look on his face. Like, so you're saying this is true, right? And it's like, and he's really kind of poking fun at those people and, and embarrassing them for their dim-witted- um, candy from a baby. <laughs> oh my God, it's bad, but it's, but it's hilarious. Uh, but anyway, um, one way of thinking about this is that, and this is just a framing, is that if you wanted to be a weaving the world correspondent, then weaving the world is the envelope or the, or the wrapper of the umbrella. Um, you are like, like we cooperate on when we pre create, create episodes, um, you figure out what your trail of, of, of reporting or episodes is going to be like, um, I help, you know, help host frame, do whatever. Um, and we, we figure out who else is attracted to help you do your particular path. Right. I don't um, have a particular path. My no. particular path is whatever whatever emerges at the time. Like I, I you want- You have an emergent to... path, but I think you have a path. I think, I, think, I think the reason we've been talking about this and the reason you're proposing uh, Global Mind and some framing around it is that I think you have a, a vision and a path that's just like, you're happy to let it emerge and explore it where, where it shows up, but you have a concept of what it is and directionally what it is. I feel like it's, a template of the way your mind thinks. Right. And I, I've said that to you before. Um, and so and so I'm interested in like representing this online in, in, and, and for muggles coming in, it's got to look and smell like something. So if we borrow the idea of correspondence, so, so one of the notions is that Weaving the World is one of many parallel shows. Everybody knows what a show is, <clears throat> um, which would mean then that you would be the host of a show doing all the stuff we talked about. And you're like, I'm not so interested in doing that. Um, as a correspondent, the, the umbrella and everything else I'm taking care of, like we're, we're running along doing open, you know, open, uh, weaving the world. Um, but then you wind up creating a trail of episodes and we can, you know, we can collaborate and connect a whole lot more. So maybe we do that. Yeah. What, I, and again, I just want to say like, I, I also want to collect other correspondents. Like I, in this grand picture, right. I always see you are like, the tie to like all the tech people. You're that the liaison there and then back to the middle. And I'm the tie to the muggles and I'm the liaison there. And that's how we weave, <clears throat> we weave the world by bringing both ends up together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool, I like that. I like that a lot. And um, definitely we need to focus on more women. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and And, we could easily create a thread about women's issues and all that kind of stuff and just pursue that for, for, for a while up front. But like, that'd be great to do because I think if we actually paid attention to, to things that women care about, more women would show up. Am I wrong I about actually, that? Um, <clears throat> I, don't, I don't know. Maybe you might be wrong about that actually. Okay. Um, I, would, I would love, so I just, I just thought that, but I would love to know what would actually work. Um, yeah, and, and, and then inviting the, I would, I think what would work is having the expert woman come and do the speaking. She brings her own group. Then we get to mingle with that group. And we like keep, Michelle, and that, like Michelle yes, Holiday. Exactly. Who'd be a great person. So let me scroll back for one thing. And then I've got to actually switch to, to sure. calls. Um, mm -hmm. Let me scroll back to the rating system on thrivability. Um, I would love to see such a thing exist. I said earlier that I, I suspect that there's a bunch of different people poking around nearby, trying different kinds of things. I also said that 
doing one, actually enacting one is a gigantic project all of its own and needs resources and needs to be funded. <clears throat> so I think, it's, I think it's out of my grasp to try to build such an index, but it's definitely within scope of weaving the world to go find the different missing parts of it and then provoke such a thing to come into existence somehow and help it. That's like, that's, that's completely in scope. Right, so, so what about like just scheduling a call Bingo. Inviting people like Michelle. And the question, the focus of the call is, what would a rating system look like? Yeah. How do we how do we evaluate thrivability? Uh, how do we create a rating system? Who's doing it all? Who's doing it already? Um, and that's the whole call, though. That's the whole call. But, then it could be divided into. So like you said, who's doing it already? That could be a link to the call. Yep. If somebody's interested in following that route, they follow that route. Somebody right. else might just want to watch the call. Somebody else might want to just add their opinion to the call. Yep. I'll let I'm you with go. you. I know you got to go, but I'm with you. These are the calls. I mean, I bet you if people saw this call, they'd be like, oh, that would have been interesting to be there. I would like to add my two cents. Uh... Okay. So I think that, like, uh, Michelle Holiday and Thrivability call is an interesting thing to pitch as one of the first episodes of Weaving the World. Make sense to you? Yes. And let's specifically invite people like Anne. Yep. People like Allison. I have one or two women friends that I want to invite, specifically invite yep. them. Yep. Sounds great. And, and Jean Russell would be fun to invite too. Um, I wrote a page in her book on Thrivability back almost 20 years. Have no um, idea who that is. Oh, she's a dear old friend who's who, I look forward like, to meet them. Who, oh, was, what about that woman, Susan? Which Susan? Stucky? Do you want to come? The one that, yes. Sure, the I one. can invite Susan Stucky. She's open to a lot of stuff. Susan, Susan Stucky is super interesting. She used to be at the Institute for Research on Learning, which was a Xerox Park ancillary organization. And she runs really deep on, especially how humans learn online in social spaces. I was, was so interested seeing her talk. I would love the opportunity. She was to meet a con her. consultant to IBM for many, many years and, and all that kind of stuff. But she's sort of academic, but not academic, which is really interesting because she runs really deep on, on all the theory. And I just want to say, think about these calls, not just for the call itself. Think about these calls as an opportunity to meet other people. They're mm -hmm. like, this is really like a networking, socializing kind of activity. Mm -hmm. Sounds great. Um, I'm going to have to bounce, but okay. thank you. Um, thank you. <laughs> this, this feels like we've designed an episode, so that's a good start. <laughs> All right. Take care. Thanks. You too. Bye, Stacey.